Hello and welcome to the Potential Psychology Podcast. I'm your host, Ellen Jackson, and it's my mission to share the science of human behaviour in a practical, fun and inspiring way. In each podcast episode, I interview an expert from the fields of psychology, well-being, leadership, parenting or high performance. I pick their brain to uncover what they know about living well, what tips do they have for you and I, and I quiz them about how they apply their expertise in their own life. Join me as we discover simple, science-backed ways to live, learn, flourish, and fulfil your potential. Hello, welcome back to the Potential Psychology Podcast. I hope you're well. I hope you're relaxed. I know this is a really busy time. It's exactly four weeks until Christmas as this goes to air, and that means crazy, crazy for many of us. But I hope it also means that you are anticipating some time out from the day today, that you get a holiday over the Christmas period because of all of our priorities, work and family and household and financial and social, downtime is often the priority that gets neglected the most, but it is so important. In fact, the research tells us that driving yourself hard without any breaks reduces your productivity and your focus. And that taking time to get out of the details and create space by giving yourself a break helps you to get a better view of the bigger picture and helps us really to better understand the purpose and priority of our tasks. So that's very much what I use my time out after Christmas for, to chill and allow my brain to relax because that's when the ideas come. That's when I know I can get some mental distance and start to plan for the new year. And because I'm planning at that stage in a relaxed state, you know, just kind of allowing the thoughts to come instead of trying to force them to a timetable, and I can do that without also having to do the doing of it, you know, I can kind of spend a while thinking, making notes on the beach, then go for a swim, maybe go for a walk, then follow up with the gin and tonic. And the planning and the ideas really then, because you're in a more relaxed state, they start to help build excitement and motivation for what it is you're hoping to achieve for the new year. So it's a really fantastic positive spiral, which is a great way to kick off 2020, but it does require you to take a break to create that mental space. So for 2020, because each year I put together what I call the Psychologist's Personal Projects Planner, which is a little guide that I created a few years ago to help with my priorities, goals and plans for the new year. And I usually send a copy of that out to subscribers around Christmas time. So if you're going to have a break, and I hope you are, and you want a bit of help with that downtime planning, inspiration, motivation for the new year, and you'd like a copy of the Psychologist's Personal Projects Planner, not the easiest thing in the world to say, make sure that you're on our email list and you can join the email list if you're not already at potential.com.au forward slash subscribe and we'll get a copy of that out to you in preparation for your Christmas break. Jay and I are also going to be popping some tips on the socials for both surviving and thriving through the Christmas crazy time over the coming weeks, so keep an eye out for those. And finally, we have another new and exciting initiative up and live too, and I'm going to tell you a bit about that at the end of this episode, so stay tuned. So many things to talk about today. Next up, today's episode, which is of course brought to you by the Wellbeing Evidence and Horizons Conference, which is taking place on April 28 and 29, 2020 at the Melbourne Exhibition and Convention Centre. And our guest today for this episode is a speaker from that very conference. She is Associate Professor Peggy Kern and her presentation at the Wellbeing Evidence and Horizons Conference, which she's co-presenting with Beck Melville from the Wellbeing Lab, is titled Connection, Achievement and Purpose, How to Strategically Build a Modern Workplace Culture Where People Thrive. Now, I have worked in the human resources and organisational development arena, helping people to thrive 
create workplaces that thrive. For a little over 20 years now, I actually started in human resources, specialising in developing graduates. So working with them to get their careers established, to learn more about who they are, their strengths, their interests, both to build their confidence and to help them plan the best career path for them. And I've been having similar conversations in workplaces ever since. They've all been centred on helping individuals at work to function at their best. And sometimes that's coaching one-on-one, sometimes it's working with teams or small groups, sometimes it's working with leaders to create the kind of environment in which we know people thrive. And discussion of wellbeing and thriving at work, both physically and emotionally, is one that comes up more and more as I discuss with Peggy in this episode. So how do people function at work and their wellbeing that just wasn't mentioned 10 years ago. And I don't think it was even thought about 20 years ago, but now it's something that we do discuss quite regularly. It's certainly something that organisations are seeking to develop. So they're really starting to look at how do we create a culture in which people work well, both for the organisation's benefit, but also for the individual's benefit. And that's something that I work on with my clients. So It might be presenting to whole departments or organisations on topics like understanding emotion and behaviour, thriving through stress and challenge, exploring our values and motivation, and essentially learning more about ourselves and how workplaces work so that we can work and operate at our best. And what I love about today's discussion with Peggy, as you'll hear, is that creating a thriving workplace is about leadership and it's about knowledge and it's about small steps that are integrated to create the culture and shape the behaviour of everyone in that workplace. It's much more than a program that you can roll out or bolt on activities like gym memberships or lunchtime yoga, as much as I love me some yoga. So this is really about a shift in the way that we see work and how work can help us all to thrive and to flourish. So let's continue that conversation with Associate Professor Peggy Kern. Joining me today is Dr. Peggy Kern. Peggy is an Associate Professor at the Centre for Positive Psychology at the University of Melbourne's Graduate School of Education. Originally trained in social personality and developmental psychology, Peggy received her undergraduate degree in psychology from Arizona State University, a master's and PhD in social and personality psychology from the University of California, Riverside, and additional postdoctoral training at the University of Pennsylvania. Her research explores questions about who thrives in life and why. She's published three books and over 80 peer-reviewed articles and chapters, and she's here with me today to talk about connection, achievement, and purpose, and how to strategically build a modern workplace culture where people thrive. Welcome, Peggy. Thank you. I have lots and lots to talk to you about today because workplaces and helping people to thrive at work is kind of what I do from a very practical perspective. So I'm hoping I can learn a little more from you to share with my own clients as well as obviously sharing your wisdom with our listeners. Well, hopefully uh, through our discussion, we can come up with some good ideas for for your listeners and for yourself as well. I'm sure we will. I'm absolutely sure we will. Can I just start though, before we get into the nitty gritty of that stuff, can you just tell us a bit about yourself and how you came to be at the Centre for Positive Psychology at Melbourne Uni? Because obviously you're not from here originally and you've been at universities (laughs) all over the States. How did you get here? Yeah, I've kind of have wandered all over in many ways. Like you had in my bio, I was trained uh, in social and personality psychology, really looking at thriving across the lifespan. And then when I was at the University of Pennsylvania, my work started to take much more of an applied nature of things through, there was a master's of applied positive psychology there. And as part of that, in my work there, I really started getting into focusing on well-being measurement, developing some different measures on that had the opportunity as part of that to come over to Australia, to uh, South Australia, and do some different talks and whatnot, working with government, uh, schools, and uh, some local workplaces and whatnot, really around even why we should even care about well-being and, and measuring it in particular. Fast forward a couple of years from there, I was also uh, started doing some work with Lee Waters here at the University of Melbourne, 
and had another trip in Australia. And they're like, hey, would you ever come to Australia? And at that point, I, I was a postdoc, which is sort of a temporary research fellow at the University of Pennsylvania. So was looking to move, move on to elsewhere. And there was a, a job here that was kind of perfectly fit to me and applied to it and, and was offered the position. And so it was a two-year position. And I was like, you know, I have the opportunity to live in Australia for two years. And if I let that go, I'm going to regret it. So <laughs> moved across the world and uh, over five years later, still here and really loving it here. Really, Australia has become a home to me. Wonderful. Okay. So the planets just aligned. You were meant to be here, obviously. They just do. You know, you <laughs> never know, you know, and I, I think part of that is willingness to take advantage of opportunities and see where it leads you. I've never been one of those who has my 10 year plan of life is actually trying to set things up well, but also not locking myself into one certain trajectory, mm-hmm. um, which has really opened up a lot of opportunities that I never would have imagined for myself. It's amazing how that happens, isn't it? I was actually just today answering some questions, a business profile kind of thing about my consulting firm. And it talked about, you know, do you work to a five-year plan or a 10-year plan or, you know, what? how do you establish business strategy, all of that kind of stuff. And my experience has really been kind of the same. It's like, well, you know, it's nice to have long-term goals, but by the same token, I've mostly just kind of gone, oh, that looks fun. I'm going to try that (laughs) and just seen where it's taken me. And some of that, and this this speaks some to thinking about that sense of of purpose and how that, that really leads us is when we actually understand ourselves and kind of know this is who I am and living in alignment with that, then we actually end up navigating life in sort of ways that can bring about kind of the life we want to be living. And and we don't necessarily know what gets us there, but if we can look back and really say, you know, I can see how things really fit together, that can give a sense of, you know, for whatever reason, this was the right thing to do. How fascinating. Yeah, that that does make some sense. So having that element, I suppose, of, is it self-awareness, you know, just having an awareness of who we are and what's important to us? Does that play a part? Very much. So the self-awareness, but but particularly of who we are, what do we value, and then aligning our actions along with that. I know many people that they might actually know their values and yet they're living to other people's values. And so there can be a disalignment there. The other one is often we don't even know ourselves. And we're seeing that in, in a lot of people is just sort of this sense of struggle in terms of who am I, how do I really fit in with things? And so some of that self-awareness becomes a very core part of that. Mm. It, it is interesting because again, I mean, we're going to talk a bit about workplace well-being and part of your, as I understand it, your research is around things like that kind of sense of purpose. Mm -hmm. These are not conversations that we have at work or certainly have not had previously. Can you tell us before we get into that, why do we care about workplace wellbeing? What is it and why do we care? Yeah. So from the perspective that I really work with, which comes more from the positive psychology perspective, we're really thinking about wellbeing in terms of feeling and functioning well across different areas of life. Often when people think about well-being, they're actually thinking about the lack of ill-being. So sort of the lack of disengagement, the lack of feeling you know, depression and anxiety and whatnot. And so this perspective is really saying, well, there's actually more than just even surviving work. What does it actually really mean to show up each day, be excited about your job? Maybe it's not every day that I'm excited to do what I do, but it does kind of lift you up and it's something you want to be doing and whatnot. And so you are contributing and functioning well within the workplace. And so that's sort of the perspective that that I'm working from. And what that looks like might be different for different people, but we certainly see that sense of thriving there. And I think that's a really important point, that perspective, because I, from my experience and my work, for a long time, perhaps only until very recently, when we've talked about things like mental health at work, when we've talked about well-being at work, it has been about, you know, how do we stop people from struggling with mental ill health, hasn't it? Th- that's exactly it. It's been how do we stop things from going horribly, horribly wrong, <laughs> which is important, but it, it's only part of the picture. That's exactly it, is our typical approaches to things is reactive in nature. It's sort of like, okay, we're doing well until we're not doing well. There's huge concerns over disengagement, employees who are struggling with their mental health, things like, are you okay? And and whatnot coming out to really, really address that. 
And those are really, really important because when workers are not functioning well, then it affects every area of life. But it's much better if people don't actually get to that in the first place. We spend so much time at work. A national survey suggests that people spend an average of 40 hours at work per week. That's an average. Mm. Many people, it's much more than that. And what we're seeing now is the idea of the nine to five job in many cases doesn't exist anymore. There's a blend of our life between work and home. And so what's actually happening with me, with my work, it affects me in the workplace. It also affects my home life, my interrelationships, my family, with my community and whatnot. And if everything that we're actually about is just sort of surviving day to day and staying away from that, being depressed, being anxious, being stressed out, et cetera, that's not actually living life to the fullest. And so it's actually moving towards something more than that, that almost like lifts us up more than sort of just uh, uh, drags us down. So it's much more of an approach as opposed to avoidance, Mm -hmm. proactive as opposed to reactive, and also focusing on what's good and right in us, as opposed to what we're often doing is we're always looking for the problems, always looking at what's wrong. And, and, and humans are amazing. If we look for problems, we will find them. And if we don't find them, we create pro- problems. <laughs> Make them up. <laughs> we, we do. And so we create problems for ourselves that don't actually exist. Well, actually focusing on the strengths that we have and whatnot shifts that view. So really moving from just surviving at work to thriving at work and then that complete picture of a human being of of work plus home plus community you know and and the fact that there's a kind of a ripple effect between the three that's very much and and when we start to look at well-being from that sense the studies really point to various reasons why it's important to actually actively promote well-being we do see the studies do suggest that those who report higher well-being are also nearly six times more likely to be engaged in their work, um, which means they're actually being better workers, more productive. Huge issue often we have in workplaces that people might be there, but we have what's called presenteeism. And so they're there, but they're not actually there. Workers who are doing well are much more likely to be making good use of the time that they're actually there. Um, So they're more productive. They tend to be more satisfied with their jobs. And when we think about Uh, turnover and having to find people, train them up and whatnot, as employees get dissatisfied, they're more likely to leave, which is going to create more costs for the organizations. Studies suggest that those who have high well-being have 70% fewer seriously incidents. That's reducing accidents, that's reducing things like negative workplace behaviors and whatnot. And so they're showing up to work a different person, which is actually better for everyone else around them you have less turnover, they're less likely to take kind of sick days, whether they're actual physical or mental health that's occurring there, less likely to quit. Customers tend to be happier when when workers are doing well. And there's some suggestions, so cost analysis have suggested that for every, this is in US dollars, but for every single dollar invested in supporting well-being, it's about a $2.13 return on investment. So you're over doubling what you're actually putting into that support there in terms of what you actually get out. So amazing statistics there, a big shift from perhaps how we used to view things like how do we generate greater productivity and how do we stop people from the kind of churn and burn and those sorts of things. So a big shift and compelling arguments, I think, for organisations, therefore, for businesses and other organisations to help their staff to be well. And from the sounds of things, also benefits for the individual as well, that enjoying your job more, which is something that I think a lot of people seek. It it certainly is. And and we're seeing it more and more in younger generations. And so we're seeing a real shift in terms of seeing job as this is what I go to to earn my income. And then there's the rest of life. There's the family, there's the community. And it's not sort of my identity. What we're seeing now, especially as we get to those in their 20s and 30s, even going to their 40s, is people who are looking for more from work than just a paycheck. They want something that gives them a sense of meaning and purpose. It gives them 
connection with others. I mean, we've had this whole kind of growth of working at home and whatnot. And what we find is people start to go to social spaces because they still want that social connection. I'm putting my hand up because I'm here at my co-working space at the moment, having worked from home or on client sites for many years. Suddenly I had the opportunity to join a co-working space and went, yes, I'm there because yeah. of that very reason, that kind of connection, just having other people to talk to, whether it's bouncing ideas around or just to talk about what you did on your weekend. You know, that connection is really important. So we are social creatures mm-hmm. and that's true, whether it's work or not work. And so, you know, we are seeing that as much as we're like, okay, this is going to change everything. We'll just work at home, be in our pajamas all day and whatnot. People are actually drawn to the social spaces and we need to actually have have that, whether that's in the workplace or in the shared spaces. We also see this greater sense of identity that work really gives. You see those who want things as not just a, a job that I'm paid for, but this is really almost my calling or this is what really fills me up. And so we see that deep connection of the work I do and how I actually see myself as a person and looking for that in many of our workplaces. So this is quite an evolution over a fairly short period of time, isn't it? Just that kind of moving from I work to live to work is part of my life, but not necessarily in a I'm overworked, stressed, I can't let go of it way. But again, like that identity that you're just talking about, this is I do this because it fulfills me. I do it because it's part of my purpose or it gives me a sense of meaning. And that shift seems to have happened quite quickly. In many ways, it it seems like it has. I mean, it's hard to say how much things have shifted over time versus we're just more aware of Mm -hmm. of all of this because, you know, with things like social media, everything, everything is much more visible in the past. But this is all intersecting in terms of shifts in in the types of jobs that we do. We've gone from either, you know, family businesses or a lot of sort of industry where it's a lot of sort of just repetitive tasks to tasks that are actually much more requires cognition, requires creative thinking, people working together uh, with the tech changes in technology, the nature of work has changed. And with that, what we expect from work has changed as well. Okay. So you're saying lots of socio-cultural type shifts going on there that are kind of all aligned to bring us perhaps to this point. Exactly. Yeah. So what is it that drew you to this work, having had experience in a raft of different areas of psychology, why did suddenly, or perhaps not so suddenly, (laughs) workplace well-being become meaningful to you? Yeah, so I think my interest in working in this area has evolved over time. I mean, I think one thing that draws me to the work is, or the workplace, is my early work has really focused on thriving across life, and even thinking about things like healthy aging and longevity. So who lives well and what really contributes to that? And we do see that careers actually do have an impact even on how long we live and our health and our social relationships and whatnot. So work actually plays a very important role when we start to consider our entire trajectory, especially people might work from their teen years all the way through maybe 65. What we're seeing now is those after 65 are continuing on. And so that plays a huge role in things. Some of my other work is focused on schools. And so thinking about our young people, but what happens at work impacts our young people because I bring home how I'm feeling at work. And so if we want to be supporting our young people, we actually have to be thinking about supporting our parents, which happens through work. So some of it is thinking about how work really intersects with kind of our journeys through life. The other thing that really brought me into this area is working with my colleague, Michelle McQuaid. And so I developed this measure of well-being and we started working with this and she's like, well, the measure is great, but I want to put it online. Now she's a practitioner and I'm a researcher. And so we put stuff online and started to think about how can we really intersect the research with what this practically looks like. And so I think through that, it's actually brought me much more into kind of working in the whole workspace area. (laughs) So it was obviously, again, meant to be of that kind of experience of working with the lifespan. And and as you say, you know, work is such a big part of life. It would seem silly not to delve a little further into that. Peggy, can you just explain for our audience, because we're not all psychologists, when you talk about a measure of well-being, what does that mean? What does that look like? Yeah. So when we start to say, well, how do I actually capture what is your well-being like? What we do is we try to take it from something that's very abstract, how you're feeling and functioning and saying, well, 
how can we get make that more concrete? And so, and oftentimes the psychologist will come up with a scale or a self-report measure. We can do it through interviews or other ways to really try to understand from a person's perspective how they're actually going. So for instance, this one measure I created, it, it's built on this model within the pause site space called the PERMA model. Um, so this comes from Martin Seligman, who's one of the, the founders of the field of psych- positive psychology. And he suggests that there are several different pillars that contribute to our well-being. And so positive emotion, engagement in life, relationships with others, a sense of meaning, and a sense of accomplishment. I like to include a H in there for our health or how we're, we're feeling physically. Mm-hmm. And so then we have some items. And so you can complete the items and say, well, how am I going in these different areas? It's almost like stepping on a scale and saying, well, here are my emotions. This is how good my sense of meaning is. Here are how my relationships are going. And so when we say we're measuring well-being, it's some sort of measure like that to say, well, where are people on the sort of metric of well-being? It's, it's not a perfect metric. We can't actually capture that abstract thing, but it's a way of trying to get it, make it a bit more concrete. Okay. And we know that those five pillars of Seligman's well-being model, the PERMA model, are important for our well-being generally. How well do they translate to workplace well-being? Are they still important? Well, what I find in, in terms of these different pillars is it's a way to actually make this idea of well-being more tangible. So if I, if I tell you, you know, let's work on your well-being, what do you do with that? <laughs> That's a good question. You're like, okay, what am I going to do to actually get better? You know, when we actually start to look at those, it actually gives me something to do. It says, well, let's think about your relationships. How well do you actually connect with others? Do you feel supported by others? Are you actually there for others? And so that gives us some tangible things that we can actually be doing in order to actually be improving our well-being. And what I find is actually as I start working in my relationships or I find ways of building meaning in my work, or I, I bring out my strengths or, or things like this, my well-being overall, how I'm feeling and functioning improves. So if we can do more of it, then that gives us a pathway to be able to improve that well-being, which as you say, you know, is going to work at work. If I can have great relationships at work, whether it's with colleagues or peers or maybe my boss, if I can have a sense of accomplishment, achievement, like I'm getting stuff done that's meaningful and that it's important. If I get moments where I get to laugh and have fun and be curious and be optimistic, you know, if I can do all of those things that I'm going to feel great at work and that'll spill over and hopefully I'll also feel great at home. Is that right? That's exactly it. And what we think about in terms of our well-being is it's often the little things that we do. I kind of like to think about it as what are our habitual ways of thinking, feeling, behaving, interacting with others. And as we do these little actions over time, they build up to kind of how we're feeling and functioning overall. In the same way with our, with our physical health, if I want to be physically healthy, then I might do things like eat healthy. I move a bit each day. I try to get some good sleep. There are these just core things that we do that together help me feel well physically. And it's the same thing when we start to talk about our our mental and our social health as well. Okay, that's a lovely parallel, isn't it? Because we do know what we're supposed to do. We might not always be great at doing it, but we certainly know what we're supposed to do to keep ourselves physically well in terms of those small steps. So if we can work on some of these emotional and social and and well-being elements in the same way, then we're focusing on building our that bit of our health as well as our physical health. Yeah. That's exactly it. And I mean when we think about sort of the this world that we live in, there's a lot that's really pushing down on sort of that that mental mental and social health. You know, we we have very busy lives, social media is interrupting us all the time. And so it actually interrupts are good conversations with each other. And so instead of connecting with people, I'm multitasking and not really actually listening and really actually having conversations. And so what we see is people are very disconnected. We have high rates of loneliness and people have actually lost some of those skills to actually connect well. When we think about even how we're feeling, turn on the news, how much of it is positive in nature? You know, it's all like 
you know, the climate's being destructed, there's killings happening, their mental health is, is skyrocketing. Every message we're told is how dark and miserable the world is. And when we focus on that all the time, no wonder we start to feel depressed and anxious. <laughs> And, yeah. and so it's shifting that and saying, we actually experience the worlds that we actively work to create. And it's shifting that more through the little things that we do throughout the day. Okay, so bringing us back to some real basics it around is. what heaps us as happy and well as human beings, which, yeah, you're right, we just, we forget. Well, if we ever knew, maybe we didn't know enough and then when we did learn something, we forgot it, I don't know. <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> What do you say? Because I know, and there may well be some people listening, and I know because I've had this feedback myself, you know, we can be a little bit cynical when we talk about a workplace wellbeing program. And we've certainly seen, you know, it's popped up in kind of patchy different ways in different places from yoga classes and, and mindfulness classes at lunchtime to things that are far more rigorous. And I know some people question perhaps the motivation of employers to establish such project you know they just want to get more out of, out of us they want us to be there they don't want us to take sick leave you know this is all motivated by a kind of a, a cynical view what do you say to people who raise that argument I think it's fantastic our argument and I think it's something that we need to be very very aware of it does depend a lot on the workplace and I think one thing that concerns me about the whole well-being space is it does become, okay, let's jump on the well-being bandwagon. You know, okay, Google has all these things. Let's bring in sort of the, the fitness ball or, or the yoga classes or whatever. These can be good things. And the slippery dips. <laughs> exactly. You know, these can be good things, but often what can happen if you don't actually have that sense of trust going on in the workplace, it comes across as being very tokenistic. And in that case, you know, it does feel like, okay, we're going to support well-being, but is it really about the person's well-being or is it really about that end goal of saying, well, I'm going to try to improve you for a bit so I can get more out of you? And I think that's what we really do need to be very aware of. One thing we, we've seen in some of our data is you have the workplaces that are not functioning well. And they'll talk about, oh, yeah, my employer, you know, they have the, the fruit bowl or that fitness pass or whatever. And it feels very dehumanized. And so, you know, it's like, well, you can get free gym, but they don't actually give me any time to go to the gym. Mm -hmm. And I think that can be quite problematic in terms of our efforts to actually build well-being. Okay. So it's like there's a, a, an element of lip service to it, perhaps without the care that's really required underneath. That's exactly it. You see other places, and, and often it's where there's a sense of, you know, my work, my workplace does care about well-being. Employees are doing a lot to work, look out for their employees. And in, in those places, the little extras are actually seen as these are those signs that my workplace is caring for me. So it's that understanding of what some of these things actually are, are, are doing and why they're there. I think the other thing that can happen is a disconnect between what employees think and want versus what leaders think they think and want. <laughs> and so we have workplaces, and we've seen this in some of our data, where the employers are doing a whole bunch of efforts to support well-being. And employees are either not aware of what they're doing, or they don't see it as supporting their well-being. It's, uh, you know, I might be offering different mentoring sessions and different well-being programs, but me as an employee, that doesn't fit my needs or my interests. And so all I see that is something that takes time I don't have and is actually depleting to me. And so some of it is actually bringing together those conversations between leaders and workers to understand sort of shared overlap, because oftentimes when you bring those together, you actually find there's more similarities than differences. But so much happens in terms of miscommunications, which then result in this, well, my workplace doesn't care about me when in reality they do. And then there's frustration by the, the employers because they're like, we're doing all of this. And our workers aren't responding. And it's not working. Yeah, that's interesting, isn't it? Because I think, I suppose that's a little bit about, you know, what value does this bring to me? So if I'm really, really busy at work and I'm feeling under the pump and I've got a lot of deadlines to meet and now I'm expected to go to some wellbeing 
workshop program, (laughs) even if that program itself might be beautifully designed and intrinsically worthwhile and enormously helpful to somebody, if I don't value that or I don't feel that it kind of fits with the demands of my job, then it's just not going to hit the mark, is it? So those conversations, I can see how important those conversations are to be able to get that stuff right. That's exactly it. And, you know, and even kind of the why we do things becomes really, really critical there. So, so often we move right to the, well, how are we actually going to improve well-being in our workplace? This is what we're going to do. We come up with this master plan. And we don't spend enough time on really understanding and really communicating to employees why we're doing what we're doing. Is that, you know what, we're going to start doing these efforts because we care about you as human beings. And actually building those relationships can take a lot of time and energy and a lot of effort by committed leaders. And yet taking that time for that, even with no programs or whatever going on, can actually be a, a huge element of actually changing some of the culture within the workplace. So you can do a lot of the work before you even really do anything as far as well-being and programs are concerned. There's a lot of actually, you know, and I don't think enough time is often spent on this because we're like, well, we can just grab these programs. We've checked off that well-being box, done that, done and dusted. If we actually really care about it, then actually really preparing that ground to have that fertile soil in order to actually be putting any of this in actually becomes quite critical if we actually want this to be more lasting. Okay, so it goes a long way to notions of workplace culture and the the nature of relationships there and the trust that you mentioned before and, and establishing all of that so that you can then integrate these programs. Is that right? That's exactly it. That's exactly it. And Peggy, you mentioned before that one of the why's in terms of these projects, you know, why why would we implement a, a workplace wellbeing program? Obviously there's benefits to the organization, but it is hopefully because we genuinely care about the well-being of our people. What are some of the other why's in there for organizations? There's care. Are there other factors? Well, I, I mean, I think if we really get to the heart of it, we have to think that care for the human needs to be core to it. And too often it's not because too Mm. often in our workplaces, it's actually all about, you know, profit and sort of our typical indicators of things. And yet if we look at the modern day workplace, the key capital that we actually have is our people. A lot of the tasks that we used to do in the workplace increasingly are, are disappearing because artificial intelligence is actually going to be able to do it faster and more effectively, which means those human skills that we bring are actually incredibly kind of what puts us as, as an organization or whatever, what distinguishes us from anything else that's actually out there. And so from that, I actually want my people to be showing up and able to work well because without those actual skills that actually make us human and those human attributes, then essentially what, what are we other than sort of a robot there? Mm. And so the, the person being core to things, I think, is an element of that that we need to be thinking about. Another aspect is that organizations are increasingly being called out of sort of being responsible to society and to others, to the environment and things like that. And so focusing on this whole area is, is all part of the responsibility that I think organizations are increasingly be help, being held accountable to. So another kind of sociocultural shift there as well, starting to look at mental health, well-being, what we give back to our communities, that sense of purpose, our commitment to the environment. You know, again, that that has shifted, I think, in a very positive way. It's shifted in a very positive way. And I think fueling all of this too is what we're seeing about the reports, about things like mental illness, things about domestic violence and and things like that that are all occurring and a lot of concerns and reports into all of that. I think there was a a new report that just came out suggesting that there's about $130 billion estimated cost to individuals with mental health. And so organizations are being called on to actually play a role in sort of addressing these mental health concerns that are occurring. Mm, which makes perfect sense, doesn't it? Because as you say, we spend so much time at work and, and for some, I know I've said to workshop participants that for some of us, we have longer, more well-established relationships at work than perhaps we do outside of work. There's, there's 
workplace friendships that have outlasted marriages and other relationships in our lives. It's very true. (laughs) (laughs) I know it's kind of startling to think of, but it is true. Peggy, tell me a bit about what a a gold standard, you know, we've talked about the whys and and shape some of, you know, what a good science-based workplace wellbeing program might look like. What is a gold standard workplace wellbeing program from your point of view as a researcher? Yeah, it's it's a fantastic question. And as a researcher, I don't like to get too into like, this is the the answer or anything like that. (laughs) Um, but, But part of that is I would say there's actually no one program. And the reason for that is it actually very much depends on the workplace itself, which are dynamic human social systems. And so I can even bring in a program that could be really good for my workplace at this time. And yet people are going to change. The needs are going to change. Customers come in and and sort of this environment that we're in is constantly shifting. And so we have different needs at different times. And so a good workplace program is actually being aware of the people within the organization and it's actually saying, what are the needs that we actually have and how can we actually support those well? And so it begins with an organization being committed to creating a great place to work. And each employee, whether they're a leader, whether they're an employee, no matter their position, believing that they play a role in making this a great organization. One thing I see in a lot of organizations is this blame. So leaders will blame the employees. Employees are like, well, it's the system or it's some of these things. And it's actually understanding that we are that system Mm. (laughs) and that everything that we do, how I show up, how I interact with others and whatnot is actually part of what either makes this a great place to work or a miserable place to work. I think that's such an important point. Is that I remember somebody making the point that, you know, when we might be sitting in traffic and we call home to say, oh, I'm stuck in this terrible traffic. And you so are traffic. The point, yeah, you are the traffic. You know, if you're in it, you're part of it. And I yep. think that, that really goes to the conversation about workplaces as well, isn't it? That we can talk about, ah, oh, work's really crappy and this is wrong and that's wrong. And it's like, well, you know, these are social systems, as you say, you know, you're part of it as much as anybody else and, and waiting for somebody else to fix it isn't necessarily a helpful way to go about it. Yeah. So I think the element of we want to be a great place and each of us plays a role in that no matter of our position within the organization. Along with that, there's a shared understanding of values. And so this is what our organization is about. And this is how I'm able to align with it. I might not have the same values as the organization, but I can align my values with what the organization does and what they're about. One thing we see in a lot of organizations is sort of the, this is what we claim to be. And this is how things actually are. So there's a disalignment of the values that are there or again, a miscommunication. And so leadership are communicating one thing about this is what we're about, but those who are more distant from the leaders have no idea why they're doing their work, you know? And so there's that disconnection there. So there's a shared understanding of values. And as part of this, there's a real emphasis on making this a safe place. And that's not just physical safety, which is what, we often focus on. So thinking about our health and health and safety standards, but it actually is it psychologically safe that people are actually able to question. They're actually able to have hard conversations and whatnot. And so thinking about how we actually really foster that in the workplace, a program that really emphasizes and builds that sense of safety is going to be part of that. And as part of that, it's focused on kind of being value-based. And so people act with integrity. There's a sense of trust. So I'm not saying there's a program that actually builds all of this, but I think there are elements of this that we want to be thinking about in our well-being efforts. So is that where we start? Because, and I know because, you know, I work in this field myself, people, systems, organizations, they're enormously complex. There's, it's not straightforward. Things like values, you know, so critical to our experience of work, that shared sense of values that, that, you know, what the organization purports to represent is what I feel strongly about myself. But they're not easy things to even have a conversation about, let alone do something about are they? So Yeah. And the challenge is as soon as we start to like map all of this out and whatnot, it gets complex and then people shut down. Yeah. But the more that we can actually get people across the organization together, getting to know each other, that relationship component actually is so relevant. And oftentimes removing that hierarchy, you know, so people in very different roles, having conversations with each other and actually finding common ground actually gives people a place to start to work together of this is where we want to go and this is what I can actually do within that to actually get there. 
because then it's, it's less of that, well, they do this, I do that or whatever, but it's much more about where are we going? So it's finding that shared alignment. Relationship is core to that. Appreciative inquiry is one tool that, that we use at times. So an inquiry that actually brings different perspectives together and actually fosters conversations and sort of dreaming of what could be and designing that together can be a way that can actually help start some of those conversations really happening, but then constantly revisiting all of this to say, well, where are we at? Where are we connecting? Where are we disconnecting? And how do we actually need to be adjusting things in different parts of the organization and whatnot to get to where we want to be? Is something that takes continued effort and continued care and focus. So it's not that okay, we've done well-being now. <laughs> we can't tick that box. <laughs> well, that's the thing is I think so often we want to bring in a program so that we can check that box. We've done well-being. Great. We can put that on a record. But actually, if we really want to be doing well-being, then it's something that we have to give continued care and priority around to say we care enough about this to make this core business as opposed to side business. So it's less of a program really and more something that we integrate into the culture. It's just the way we work. That's exactly it. So if I was an HR person then thinking about how I could improve workplace well-being in my organisation or a leader in organisation, are you suggesting that one of the kind of, and I was about to use the word simplest, but there's nothing simple about this, but maybe one of the smaller places to start or a discrete place to start would be around these relationships and conversations, trying to break down some of those structures that can make us feel unsafe, that can contribute to misunderstanding, that can lead to trust issues or respect issues. Yes. So building some of those relationships, and I, and I do think in some places to start, sometimes evaluation can be helpful. And in terms of just really hearing from different people's voices of what's really going on, and that could, that could be hard to pull out because we put up all sorts of walls, especially mm. if it's sort of an unsafe place. Mm. But, you know, if we can actually really get at, well, how are things really here? And what does that mean in terms of what we want to go? So understanding some of that, a huge part of this is kind of building some of those conversations and relationships and willingness to kind of get out of things have to be my way and actually say, well, let's may, let me actually understand how things really are and how we can move together in towards of what, what it actually could be. So those relationship elements become very, very important. And then I think along with that is, is starting to create a common language giving people some skills and knowledge and tools. But as part of that is, and that's where some of the programs and trainings can be quite helpful, is starting to bring commonalities to even how we think and how we feel. You know, if I'm talking about our values and I'm talking about things in ways different from how you understand it, we have disconnection. As we create some of that shared language, it helps us start to move together where we want to be going. So even talking about how we think and how we feel, I think is probably not something that a lot of organizations do. So starting with simple things like that, you know, what goes on here? How do we behave? How do we feel about what goes on? Is this helping us? Is it not helping us? Well, I think the reality is we have to be willing to ask some of those hard questions and actually listen to the responses because (laughs) what happens is we ask those questions of how are things really going on and we're not listening for the response. I'm sure we've all been on the receiving end of one of those workplace surveys where they say, we want to hear from you. And then and we you, know you fill don't. in all the forms. And, yes, and you know, we... they're not going to do anything about it. <laughs> yeah. You know, so if we actually have to be willing to actually ask those questions and say, no matter what comes from this, we're actually going to act upon it. Even if it means I don't actually want to know what I find from that, mm. which can be a really, really hard thing to actually move forward and do. And, mm. and does take the sense of maybe my way is the wrong way. <laughs> Yeah, maybe what I'm doing as a leader here or as an organisation is really not working and I need to be prepared to accept that and think about how we might do things differently, which is hard for human beings, isn't it? We don't like to be told we're getting it wrong. (laughs) It's very hard. There's a whole approach that that I've come across. It's called youth theory. And so it's this whole idea of people coming together and, and actually just taking time to kind of sense how we are as a system. And then actually moving together so that we can actually collectively change it. But that does come with this whole sort of, we're going to actually come together and we're actually going to let go of, I have to be right. And we're actually going to come to an understanding of who we are and where we're really at and willing to set that aside so that we can actually move forward to perhaps a better place of where we actually want to be. 
Mm -hmm. But those are hard conversations to have. Mm. And people, there actually has to take some commitment. And, And oftentimes, especially as a HR leader, is actually thinking about working with leaders and really thinking this needs to actually start even from the top if you're going to have the organization really committed to creating that culture change. Mm, Because it does start with the leader, doesn't it? (laughs) Leadership starts. And what's that? There's a Simon Sinek phrase that he uses. It's not coming to me right now, but I've used it. The leader sets the tone. They do. They do. And, and, And regardless of what we say, you know, you can have those taglines of like, well, everyone's a leader and whatnot. The reality is we do have leadership positions and, Mm. Within that, that can bring some power, but it also brings responsibility to really be saying, well, I'm a leader of people. And so I actually need to be putting my people first and foremost and not put myself first and foremost. Mm -hmm. Which is one of the reasons I'm so passionate. And I expect this might be the case for you too about workplace psychology and the fact that we can actually work with people who can have such a huge influence on others' experience of being human, being human at work, being able to fulfill our sense of purpose or be our best or contribute or feel a sense of achievement. Because again, as leaders, we're not trained in that. (laughs) There's no leadership 101 course that teaches us how to understand human beings, unfortunately, but maybe we'll work together to build that kind of notion. Yeah. Well, I mean, you think about how people quickly often end up in leadership positions. Yeah. They, they perform very well in the role. And so they're pushed up to the next level, but that doesn't mean we necessarily teach them kind of all the skills that actually takes when you actually change those roles and whatnot. And mm. so many of them are actually people skills. Yeah, absolutely. And again, as you say, you know, with the changes that are taking place in work with increased technology and what have you, just the nature of work and, and the requirement to really be a full and complete person bringing your best to work every day is is going to be more and more important. So we need to be able to get this stuff right and support our leaders to be able to get this stuff right. And I think as part of that is we need to be thinking, you know, for HR leaders out there, change starts with us. You know, are we actually willing to make the changes in ourselves or actually are we all pushing it to others? Because it's actually we need to start there if we're actually going to impact those around us and others in the organization. Mm. So if I'm saying that, relationships are really important here. Conversations are really important here. I actually need to be building those relationships and having those conversations myself to kind of That's exactly role it. model it. It's so much like parenting, isn't it? <laughs> it is. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so many parallels. Peggy, we've talked a bit, I know I mentioned in our little intro that the components of your workplace wellbeing, I suppose, research, cover, connection. And we've talked a bit about Mm -hmm. relationships. We've touched a bit on a sense of purpose. Achievement is the other. What's the role of achievement in workplace wellbeing? The achievement or accomplishment, I really see as sort of thinking about that sense of competence, of making progress towards the goals that I want to be, be completing and whatnot. And so it's a sense of I'm actually able to do the things that are important to me. And thinking about in the workplace, are you actually setting goals and actually working towards and making progress towards us? Well, you know, and oftentimes the, the things that matter most to us actually take time and energy to do. But when we actually achieve them, it actually does give us this real sense of accomplishment. What happens too often though is we have these important goals that would actually give us a sense of accomplishment if we actually work towards them, but we put them aside. Because we're so busy putting out the fires and kind of dealing with the the immediate and the urgent as opposed to what is really clear and important. And so with that accomplishment part is number one is even understanding what are the goals I really want to be working towards? And am I actually making progress towards kind of becoming that person or doing the things I want to be doing in the workplace? And this is happening at a really individual level, isn't it? This is yeah. this is not, we can't say your goals are, you know, for this whole division or this team should be X because when we're talking about that sense of accomplishment and working towards meaningful goals, that's going to be really different for each individual potentially. And we've seen this in some workplaces is actually thinking about they they change their model of KPIs in order to be much more individual. So instead of sort of being like this blanket benchmarks of you need to be doing this, they're actually saying, well, what are your actual personal goals to be accomplishing over this period? And then you're actually showing the evidence that you're working towards that and giving you that sense of, wow, I really am fulfilling the things that are important to the organization, but are important to me as well. 
The other aspect of that that goes into that accomplishment element is a sense of, of sort of competence or I actually can do my job. And there are times that we feel like, yeah, I actually understand what I'm doing. There are other times it's sort of, I have no idea what I'm doing. And it can be a very talking about adding anxiety and things like that. We have a lot of people in our workplaces that have sort of the imposter syndrome of, you know, I'm here and someone's going to figure out I don't actually belong. <laughs> I don't really know what I'm doing. Well, pretty much, you know, <laughs> but, but in the reality, the more we can actually do the sense of, you now you have your own areas of expertise and living well to that, you do your work better and feel better for it as well. Mm. So again, there's an element of conversation in here with people to be able to actually talk about because there, there needs to be an overlap. I mean, it's, it's all very well to say, yeah, we just need to, you know, find a, a set of goals that are meaningful and will contribute to a sense of accomplishment for individuals. But of course, they do need to overlap with the organisation or the team or the division's goals. <laughs> they, they definitely need to. So we really need to be thinking about, and in some places where I've seen this well is actually bringing more of that coaching element. And so if I'm meeting with a supervisor, actually having this sort of coaching conversation around, well, what are your actual goals on things? This is what the organization wants to do. So where do we find the alignment? Mm -hmm. So that actually brings that, well, this is what the organization wants. This is what I want. And this is how we can actually work out some things that actually bring those two together. And again, creates that connection and that shared conversation and alignment of values in terms of both what I do and how I can actually serve the organization well in that which if I care about the organization, because I'm a part of creating a great place to work, then I actually do want to work towards that. So from a practical point of view, again, it comes back to helping leaders to have developed those skills around coaching, around those sorts of coaching conversations in order to establish what's going to work best for both parties there. Exactly. And again, sometimes, you know, some cultures, people do that really, really well. They have a strong coaching culture. They know how to ask interesting probing questions that get to the heart of the issue but in other places that doesn't happen much at all and and we certainly see differences in, uh, across different workplaces we also see differences within workplaces you know so there are some workplaces where some people do this really well and actually having them train others or share their experiences and get others excited about it and whatnot could be a really good way to bring others along so we find those pockets of where things are working well and use that to kind of help others in the organization. And I think that's a wonderful tip for those people listening who are looking at how do I improve our workplace well-being is that, you know, where's it already working well? I love that kind of model, that mindset of saying, let's not try and reinvent the wheel here. Let's just look at what we've already got, what's working well. Are there people who do have great coaching conversations, who have established great relationships with their team, who have a team who are thriving and flourishing and what are they doing and how can we do more of it? It's so important because so often it's like, you know, programs come in and some of this assumption that, well, everything's broken here. Yeah. Every organization has strengths. There's pockets of people doing things really, really well. We know that because the organization is still taking along. And so instead of saying, well, everything's wrong, actually spending that time to say, well, where are things working right? What are they doing? How can we make more of that? Because it's a lot easier to move from what we're doing well and expand that then to kind of have to relearn all sorts of new things is to kind of start from scratch. Peggy, that's a lovely positive way to kind of finish up. I think there's, there's so much more that I could talk to you about, so many more questions I could ask and so many other bits of this because it is big and complicated but also fascinating and so worthwhile. We could spend a lot longer picking over it, but I know you've got important work to do. <laughs> You will be speaking at the Wellbeing Evidence and Horizons Conference next April on this topic. Is that right? Yes, I will be. Which is very exciting. And I'm looking forward to hearing you speak further on it and maybe saying hello while we're there as well. And I'm hoping that a lot of our listeners might be able to make it as well. Where else can people find out more about you and your work and your research and maybe some of the topics that we've spoken about today? Yeah, so to find out more about me, I have a website, PeggyKern.org. So mm -hmm. welcome to uh, look into that and some of the other work that I do, both in this area and related. A website that we developed with this PERMA tool is permasurvey.com. Um, what that does is let you just take the survey and it actually then gives ideas of how to build the different pillars. And so you can actually connect with some of the research, but then also really practical ways to actually start bringing some of this into your life or into the workplace as well. Fantastic. And that's PERMA with an H on the end. Is that right? P-E-R. 
M-A-H survey. Dot com and we will put that in the show notes for the episode as well so people can find it. Yeah. So that's a great one. And another website that I actually really like is one called wellbeingrecipes.com. Oh yeah. So it's a free site and it's it sort of takes this idea of just little recipes that you can do to kind of build your well-being. Also gives some ideas around ways you can bring it into the workplace as well. So again, those little things that we can do to improve our own well-being and that of those around us. Fantastic. I know that's something because this can be such a big and complex topic when we start getting into it. But I think to always be able to bring it back to the small steps, the little things that we can do to start, the things that pique our interest or our curiosity and maybe traveling those parts. So hopefully there is, well, I know there's plenty of stuff there for any of our listeners who are interested to explore and inquire a little more as to what might work in your workplace or indeed for your general wellbeing. Because as we said right at the beginning, you know, this is not, work doesn't exist in a vacuum. It's all tied up together with our home life, our community, our general wellbeing. So Peggy, again, thank you so much. I really enjoyed and appreciated everything that you've shared with us today and look forward to seeing you at the Wellbeing and Evidence and Horizons Conference next April. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for sharing that conversation with Associate Professor Peggy Kern with me. You can catch Peggy at the Wellbeing Evidence and Horizons Conference in Melbourne on the 28th and 29th of April 2020, where she'll be presenting on day one, I believe, along with her colleague Beck Melville from the Wellbeing Lab on connection, achievement and purpose, how to strategically build a modern workplace culture where people thrive. And to find out more about the conference and to register, head to weh.org.au. Early bird registration is available until the 28th of February 2020. And if you'd like a transcript of today's conversation or you'd like to find out more about Peggy, her work, the resources we mentioned in this episode and the Centre for Positive Psychology at the University of Melbourne, you'll find all the links you need in the show notes for this episode. So pop over to potential.com.au forward slash podcast. Now, I did mention in the intro to today's show that we have something new going on here at the Potential Psychology Podcast. We do, in fact, have a heap of new things going on. And if you're on our email list, you will have seen some of them because an email went out just recently. But the one that I wanted to mention today here is our new podcast, Facebook Group. So I've been meaning to create a Facebook group for the podcast in forever, and I've finally managed to do it. And we've had lots of wonderful community members join the group already, and I'm really keen to have you along there too. The Facebook group is where we can chat about topics covered in each episode. You can ask questions of me or of our guests. I'll share some behind the scenes stuff. I'll share links to the resources that are recommended by our guests. I'll add links to books and articles because I know that you love to learn. It's really anything and everything that you want it to be because it is a community space. That's what I've created it for. So to find us, just search the Potential Psychology Podcast on Facebook. You'll find the group click the link, send a request to join, and I will add you in. I'm really looking forward to seeing you there. Okay, so next week on the show, we're up to episode 68, can you believe? And I'm speaking to one of the co-authors of an amazing new book called Tales from the Valley of Death, Reflections from Psychotherapy on the Fear of Death, which sounds pretty grim, (laughs) But it is, in fact, incredibly inspiring, quite uplifting and absolutely fascinating. It's filled with case studies of people who, at perhaps the core of some of their distress and dysfunction and mental ill health, is an underlying fear of death. And it's explored through these case studies of actual clients, their real stories, through a little question and answer, bookended with some fascinating 
information from the research and some existential philosophy type stuff. It really is quite magical. And I'm going to be chatting to psychologist and researcher in the area of death anxiety and co-author of the book, Rachel Menzies. And here she is with a sneak peek into that conversation. Death anxiety is a common part of being human. It's this idea that we all have this inherent desire to live, to thrive, to survive but we're also probably the only species that knows that death is inevitable. And so this pairing of wanting to live, but also knowing that we can't do that forever can produce this anxiety in people. So death anxiety is something that most of us will experience, but in varying degrees. We might worry about different things. So I might worry about the death of my loved ones, whereas someone else might be more worried about their own death, dying in pain, dying of terminal illness, and so on. So it can sort of latch onto different things, but essentially it's just this fear of our own mortality or fear of impermanence more broadly. That's next week on the Potential Psychology Podcast. We're on the countdown to Christmas. I can't wait to see you then for that episode, episode 68. But in the meantime, stay safe, go forth, thrive, flourish and fulfil your potential.